Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 24th online wine tasting. And tonight we're going to be covering the wines of Sicily. So for those of you who are, you know, living under a rock somewhere, Sicily is the island off the southern or southwestern coast of Italy. It looks a great deal like this. Uh, so we're going to jump straight into the maps here. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit here about Sarasuolo di Vittoria. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little tiny bit about the area around Palermo, especially as we get into talking about the Perricone. But really, Sicily is not a region where we really have a lot where we can talk about, oh, well, in this part of the country they do this, and in this part of the country they do this. We really don't have that, um, unfortunately. Um, the area around Mount Etna is very, very famous, and we'll talk about that in particular uh, when we get to the area in Ocipinti. Uh, but broadly, Sicily is a very contiguous region up to a point, mostly because it's so new. Uh, now, for those of you who are longtime watchers, you will recognize my sparkling 1981 copy of uh, the World Atlas of Wine, because I can't find my more updated one. It's somewhere in my house. Uh, but one thing that I actually was really uh, curious about, uh, for all of Sicily, uh, they have about a paragraph here, uh, and the one that I really, really like uh, is, the advent of Sicilian table wine, however, is something new. So here we are 40 years on uh, from when this book was published, and we have a whole topic just on Sicilian table wine. So let's jump in a little bit with that Sicilian past, and let's talk about this Montalto Pinot Grigio. Uh, you'll notice at the bottom of the label here, it is Ter Sicilian IGT. Uh, that IGT is important. Uh, it means Indicazione Geografica Tipica, uh, which basically means, yes, this is a typically Sicilian wine. It's made from this long list of grape varieties, which does include Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, uh, plus your actual native Sicilian white grapes, um, which I had to actually write these down. I don't have to write down grape varieties very often, but for this one I did, uh, which are Catarato, which I did not know about, uh, Grio and Inzolia I did know about, uh, and finally Caracante, which uh, is only really grown on the slopes of Mount Etna, and I've never even actually seen one. Uh, so let's start with this and let's talk about Sicily's past. Um, I do want to point out that we also have this wine that you're enjoying from this classy bottle, uh, also available in a three liter bag and box. So this is kind of great crushing Pinot Grigio. So why are we tasting this? Why are we tasting a wine that comes in a box potentially? Well, because that's a lot of what Sicily has done historically. Um, Sicily's great contribution agriculturally, uh, when we talk about the history of the island, isn't wine, it's actually wheat. Uh, Sicily was by far and away the breadbasket of the Italian peninsula in terms of grain exports and in fact just feeding the entire peninsula. Sicily really was farm country. There were a lot of grapes grown there, but they were generally for domestic consumption. And when I say domestic, I mean like didn't leave the island, not even shipped off to the actual rest of Italy. You know, you're not going to be selling, you know, $12 Sicilian Pinot Grigio to the Tuscans. They're just not going to buy it. So it was really done domestically. When I talk about the, the history of Sicily, um, how long does the box stay good for? Six weeks. And I agree with you. This is actually pretty kick-ass Pinot Grigio for a $12 wine. Um, when I'm talking about um, the history of Sicily here, I'm talking about kind of the 1960s uh, and forward. Um, even in 1980 here with this World Atlas of Wine, they're, not, they're talking about table wines being a new advent. Uh, but by 2010, the overwhelming majority of what was actually made in Sicily uh, was not things like uh, Perricone or Nero de Vola or Frappato or Nerello Mascalesi. Um, a lot of what was grown was grown for the bulk market. These were a wine of Italy, Chardonnay, or wine of Italy, Syrah. There is an absolutely horrifying, there's 5,000 hectares of Shiraz grown on Sicily. I've never actually even seen one. Um, they, I have no idea what they're doing with it, but I've got to imagine that there's, you know, a whole bunch of bulk supermarket Shiraz probably in the UK grown in Sicily. Um, but this style of wine, this very inexpensive, let's make it well, but let's make lots of it at a low price. This is what Sicily really did starting in the early 1980s, even as far back as the 1960s, and especially up to about 10 years ago. Now, We've done Pinot Grigio before. I think we even did a Pinot Grigio week. Um, Mike has been waiting very patiently for a glass of wine, so let's get him some wine too. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so he now has to creep under the camera to get out. Um, so 
Let's talk about Pinot Grigio as a whole first, and then let's talk about the wine in your glasses uh, very specifically. Pinot Grigio as a whole, it is the pink skinned variant of the Pinot grape variety. Pinot Noir, Pinot Blanc, and Pinot Gris, or Pinot Grigio, are all genetically the same plant. If you get a very, very old, uh, probably French or Burgundian varietal of, or a vine of Pinot, uh, you can even have clusters of grapes that are red, green, and pink skin growing on the same cluster. And then, you know, slightly newer uh, variants will actually have separate bunches of red, white, and pink skin variants. Um, Really, the, the idea that you would plant a Pinot vine and it would just give you Pinot Noir is really about 1970 forward was when we finally got it genetically stable enough to just produce single varietals. So, pink skinned Pinot, what does it taste like? Well, Pinot Gris is, I don't know, I've called it on the, in the past on this wine with training wheels and that's not quite fair, but I will say for this wine, I mean, if you wanted to, you know, there is this customer, they're usually named Karen, um, and when they come in, they want a wine that's not sweet, but it's not dry. It's not oaky, but it's not acidic. It's not sweet, but I don't like that dry, tangy thing. They want a wine that apparently tastes like a bottle of Dasani. Um, and Pinot Grigio does fill that gap really, really well, uh, to the point where we get, you know, really, really, I think the joke doesn't land, but there was a brand of Pinot Grigio that was very successful for a while called Mommy's Time Out, which is the worst name for a wine I can even think of. But it was that idea of, well, this is just for, you know, suburban housewives. It's a wine. It doesn't taste like anything, um, which is awful, and you shouldn't make wine that way. Um, but that was kind of the reputation Pinot Grigio got. And it was wines very much like this that did kind of reinforce that because of the fact that they were making these wines that were soft, inoffensive. Everybody was going to like them. Yeah, I'm, I'm apparently in harsh form already tonight. We're only on the first wine, so by the time we get to the SP68, we're going to be in fine form. Hmm. Hello, Aaron. Hello. Thank you. Hey, you're very welcome. So, Pinot Grigio, you know, this is very, very far south for Pinot Grigio to have traveled in Italy. Uh, if you joined us for Pinot Grigio Week, the best Pinot Grigios are grown up uh, near Lake Garda, uh, near really the, uh, the Austrian borders and the Swiss border. This is the Alto Adige uh, or Friulia. These are basically all of the land north of Venice that's still Italy is the prime growing region for Pinot Grigio because they get those really, really cold nights. Sicily is very, very mountainous. It is not a flat place at all. So despite the fact it's very, very hot because it sticks out into the middle of the Mediterranean, um, it is actually because of the altitude, especially on Mount Etna, it can get quite, quite cold at night. And as a result, you can get wines, even, you know, big bulk wines like this that are, uh... oh, Craig is definitely an honorary soccer mom, let's be clear. Um, but you can get wines that are, you know, mechanically harvested that are still very, very good. So, yes. We spend a lot of time kind of talking about all the evils of, you know, big corporate winemaking. Um, and the wine that I actually brought up here to kind of talk about why that's not necessarily always such a bad thing. Um, for our very first Whiskey Week, we had Lee Hansen along with Andrew Lang as our guests. And Lee Hansen, once upon a time, actually created his own wine brand called Mercado. Um, he had a red and a white. The red was a Negro Maro from Puglia. The white, uh, I don't know if you can tell, but it is actually a Sicilian Pinot Grigio because they're able to buy Sicilian Pinot Grigio on the open market, just 10,000 liters or 100,000 liters of it at a time, and just bottle it off under your own private label just for Alberta, just like a guy. Well, not a guy. Lee Hansen has a rather you know, massive history. He's run agencies. He's been head wine buyers in really prestigious places. He's done things. But he is ultimately just a guy in a Calgary who just created his own Italian wine brand entirely out of whole cloth. He didn't make wine, he doesn't own a winery. He could just buy bulk wine on the, on the open market and Sicilian Pinot Grigio is something very easy to do that with. Um, I personally find this version much, much too sweet, um, but this one at least is properly dry and clean. So that was a lot of time to spend on a $12 Italian Pinot Grigio that really on its face is not that desperately interesting. Affordable wines. Who doesn't like affordable wines? So Pinot Grigio, not one of the uh, you know, native grape varieties of Sicily, neither Chardonnay, neither Shiraz, neither Sauvignon Blanc, uh, neither is Merlot. All of those have absolutely massive plantings because those are um, the 
they're the big seller names. You know, when somebody walks into a wine shop or liquor store or in the U.S. gas station, and they just want a bottle of wine for about 10, 12 bucks, you know, if you see a Nero Dovola or a Perdicone or, well, this is mostly Frappato, um, which even if you're a fairly hardcore wine nerd may not be names that you knew. Uh, two years ago, I didn't know Frappato. Uh, three months ago, I didn't know Perdicone. Sicily really is almost like Spain in the sense where they have so many native varieties that really never got any real recognition or traction internationally, and now we're starting to actually explore them. So let's jump into the first one of those. This is Perricone. Now, Perricone predominantly comes from the northwest of Sicily, Sicily around the city of Palermo. Shut up, Aaron. Um, now, when we talk about the big three Sicilian red grape fries, we have Nero Vola, which we'll taste in a minute. It's about a counterpoint for Merlot. It's got lots of bright cherry. It can be a little bit floral. It tends to be medium bodied and spicy, but it's not big and tannic and chunky. Uh, Norella Mascalese, which we're not tasting tonight because the only Norella Mascalese I have in the shop is $40 and they don't get a lot cheaper than that. Um, yeah, Norella Mascalese gets a lot of comparisons to Pinot Noir or uh, Nebbiolo, which is the great variety behind Barolo. Very pale wines, very delicate, very ethereal. These are not big, chunky, hard driving wines. Uh, and then finally, Frappato, which is kind of in the middle. It's still at its absolute biggest medium bodied. So what you're saying is, okay, we have this part of the world that's grown in intensely hot heat. And when we talk about intensely hot heat, we tend to think about big, chunky red wines. Think about, you know, most of the Spanish wineries. Think about the south of France, especially the southern Rhone, like Chateauneuf de Pape. Think of Bandol. These are big, powerful, fiery wines. Well, where is that for Sicily? All these wines we're talking about, they're light, they're airy, they're ethereal. Well, that's what Perricone is. Perricone is a grape variety that very nearly went extinct uh, post Phylloxera. Now we'll talk about phylloxera here very, very briefly. Uh, between 1865 and about 1900, effectively every single grapevine in Western Europe died because of a vine louse, uh, which was actually a nematode, uh, that came over from North America in the soil. Um, when that happened, basically every vineyard in Western Europe was able to step back and say, okay, well, we have a chance to start from square one. We can start over completely. If we have local grape varieties that have been part of our blend forever because it's our heritage, but maybe we don't have cuttings of it, or maybe it only crops two years in 10, or maybe it always gets downy mildew or whatever. A lot of very, very old grape varieties that have been grown for centuries disappeared. Um, the most famous example of that is in Bordeaux, where along with Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Malbec, and Petit Verdot, uh, the sixth grape, and actually a fairly major grape before the phylloxera outbreak, um, it just disappeared. They stopped planting it. After phylloxera, Carmenere went from being a substantial part of the Bordeaux blend to just not planted in Bordeaux. It had a real mold problem, so it really only cropped reliably four years out of ten, and as a result, they just never replanted it. So that was kind of what happened with Perricone as well. Um, Perricone is very big and muscular and powerful as a wine. And I love how rustic it is. Um, my favorite Italian grape is actually Alianico, uh, which comes from Salento, uh, not, not from Salento, um, comes from, not Prelia, Calabria, pardon me. Um, again, big, fiery, power, powerful, chunky wines. Um, and Parra County really reminds me of that. Getting Twizzler and milk chocolate. Yeah, I could see Twizzlers and milk chocolate, absolutely. But it's very rustic, isn't it? It's, it's not polished, it's not refined. So I actually got introduced to this grape variety and through this exact wine, it's the only Perricone I've ever seen. Um, Bernie, uh, who has his own wine agency, which is not jumping to mind, uh, he actually brought it in to show to me. Um, this is predominantly clustered in the Northwest, just big, chunky, powerful wines. There's that. It's funny, I know less about this grape because there just isn't much out there about it. Um, I did a lot of research for this as I usually do. Um, all of the articles about this all seem to quote each other and it's very often just the core text of the article is just cut and pasted from the Wikipedia entry on Perricone. Um, it's a brand new grape in terms of international recognition and even like Wine Searcher, which is this massive database of a thousand different things, 
And normally if you say, oh, well, I want a Cabernet Sauvignon, it's like 1.9 million examples are there. Yeah, Perricone, there were 17 examples. Like it's, it's really not something that we've seen very much of. Mm. I do love how big and powerful that is, though. Um, alcohol is still well within like normal range. It's 13.5. We're not edging up into the 14, 14 fives like the Australians or the Californians. But you definitely know you're drinking something. This is a big mouth-filling wine, which is up until like the reintroduction of Perricone into the export market, not something we really saw from Sicily. How are we doing for time? Oh, we're fine. Good. We're more than good. We might get through this thing in like 45 minutes. Perricone me. Perricone you? You got it. I think you'll like this. I think it's a, I think it's a very Aaron style of wine. Twizzlers. Twizzlers and chocolate milk. Or milk chocolate. <laughs> milk chocolate. Just a baby. Hmm. Where the heck is Craig and all the other folks with their questions? We need some questions tonight. Easy peasy. Hmm. Nice. It's really, really nice. Okay, so let's jump on to our third wine. I realize we're on our third wine only 15 minutes in. Um, I do realize, I, I do keep track of that. And we're already on wine three and we're 15 minutes in. But that's because there's no questions, isn't it? I am trying to pace myself to get uh, for this because I, I can't even go home early. I'm picking up my wife at 8.30. So, yeah, I, I'm stuck at the store till 8.30 no matter what. How much gets sold? Um, interesting question. So we actually, we've always had some Sicilian wine in the store. Um, we actually used to have our own in-house brand um, called Cusimano. Uh, which had these really interesting glass caps instead of corks or instead of screw caps. Um, we had that in a Nero Davola and a red blend for about 10 years of absolutely no one, including me, caring. Um, and they were big, chunky, kind of medium-bodied wines that were fruity and spicy and about $16, $17. They were nice, but they didn't really get anybody's blood pumping. Um, when we get to our last one, we'll talk uh, actually at some length about Ariana Ochipinti uh, and how incredibly important she has been. To say she has basically made Sicilian wine happen uh, globally is pretty much hitting the nail on the head. Without Ariana Ochipinti, without her contribution to the wine industry, Planeta made Sicilian wine accessible. It made it interesting. We're going to talk about that in a second, but really, Ariana Ochipinti made Sicilian wine interesting. Uh, the price point of the Perricone, I think these guys are around 24. Um, is there a lot of this under cultivation with the Perricone? Um, it's growing again. So remember I was talking about how much, you know, Shiraz and Chardonnay and nonsense there is in Sicily. That is gradually being torn up. Um, there was about a 400 hectare vine pull of Shiraz last year. Um, and it was all replanted with indigenous varieties, including Perricone. Um, of the major Sicilian red grape varieties, the one that has actually found some <coughs> widespread mainstream appeal is Nero Davola, and I want to really qualify that. Among wine geeks, nobody cares about Nero Davola. We're all about Nerella Mascalese and right now all about Frappato. Like, Ariano Cipinti made Frappato like the sexiest thing from Sicily, and it's all everybody wants to drink. But in terms of there being an identity for Sicilian wine on a broader scale, like to the point where you might go into like Safeway liquor and see an actual Sicilian wine on the shelf that isn't, you know, Pinot Grigio, that's actually got some Sicilian character to it, it's going to be Nero Davola. Just like Tuscany has Sangiovese, just like um, Piedmonte has Nebbiolo to make the Barillos, um, just like kind of the, the Valpolicella region, well, they sell it as a blend, but let's say it's Corvina. Really, the, the Sicilians have kind of hitch their horse to Nero Davola as being their flagship grape, their Australian Shiraz, their Argentine Malbec, their Californian Cabernet. This is really the grape that the Sicilians have said, okay, if we're going to be part of the broader mainstream wine conversation, it's not going to be Perricone, it's not going to be Frappato, it's not going to be Nerello Mascalese, and it's sure as hell not going to be Shiraz, thank God for that. Uh, it's going to be Nero Davola, and that's why it's kind of the most important wine we are going to taste tonight. Looks like you need some wine there, Mike. Perricone time. You always like Italian wine, though. And I've never had any of these. Oh, fair enough. Surprising. 
Oh, uh, yeah, I can spend a little bit more time on Norella mascalese. Um, Norella mascalese is mostly grown around Mount Etna. That's in the northeast of Sicily, Sicily so north of... That is the second time I've said Sicily, and that's the second time you've laughed, Aaron. <laughs> Screw you, man. Um, so, <laughs> Norella mascalese is mostly grown on the slopes of Mount Etna, which is an active volcano on Sicily. It's the most identifiable landmark on the island. Um, Norella mascalese is a very, very particular grape variety. It really likes volcanic soils, and it tends to be very much like uh, Nebbiolo. It has very pale, kind of dusky skins. It's not a wine that really, no matter how you make it, it's going to become big and powerful and intense. These are light, airy wines that also have a lot of aging potential. Um, it's also a wine where you couldn't make it the way they make this Pinot Grigio. You know, this is the sort of thing where it's all on a reasonably flat plain or on a, a gently sloping hill. It's going to be mechanically harvested. It will be guyu trained, so basically uh, wire trained grapes. Um, and it will be mechanically harvested via vibration. They'll bring it in a ton at a time. They've got a, you know, a carefully prepared commercial yeast that will add to the grapes. They'll make it in a steel tank. They'll age it. They'll run off the sediment. They'll bottle it. And away you go. Um, Norella Mascalese, much like Pinot Noir, um, it doesn't work that way. Um, Norella Mascalese, it needs to be hands harvested. It needs to have a lot of time and care and attention. Um, the only Norella Mascalese I have under $50 in the store is this Planeta version. Um, and that's because, really, if you get a $20 Norella Mascalese, A, they're hard to find, uh, and B, they don't taste like anything. Um, I've got a $20 Norella Mascalese in my glass. This could be Malbec, this could be Merlot, this could be Tempranillo, it could be literally anything, because to actually get what makes Norella Mascalese interesting and different and identifiable, it has to be treated incredibly carefully, and as a result, there really aren't inexpensive versions of it. So, yeah, it, it probably is Sicily's best grape, but it's grown in such tiny quantities, and you have to be so careful with it that I don't think we're ever going to have like a Norello Mascalese explosion like we did with Argentine Malbec or New Zealand Sauve Blanc. Or if we did, it would be the shortest craze in history because like Lethbridge could drink Sicily out of Norello Mascalese in about six months. So it's just not a lot of it. I'm hearing a lot of giggling in the background, so I don't know exactly what's going on, but I'm, I'm up for it. Yeah, the third is killer, and I want to spend a little bit of time with this. So this is Planeta Plumbago. Um, in terms of fame, yes, Ariana Ochipinti is right now like the superstar winemaker that everybody wants a part of. Before that, it was Planeta. You'll notice that actually my Norella Mascalese is also Planeta. Um, I actually, the very first Sicilian wine event I ever went to was about eight years ago in Calgary. It was hosted by Planeta. These guys are the benchmark. Like, if you want to talk about Sicilian wine, you're like, okay, well, what does Nero di Vola taste like? If I want to taste like the benchmark of it, by Planeta. Same thing with Frappato. Same thing with Norella Mascalese. Same thing with any of those. Planeta is incredibly high quality and very high prices um, because everything Planeta is 50 bucks, it seems like. These are the only two wines Planeta makes that are red that are under $50 a bottle, and I carry both because I think they're incredibly good, especially this at 26 The fact that Planeta makes a $26 red wine is staggering to me because that's just not what they do. They make high, high-end stuff. Um, and this is what I've always said, you know, don't buy, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to bring it back to our favorite whipping boy, Apothic Red. Don't buy the super duper extra special President's Grand Reserve Apothic Red because you're getting the best that $12 winemaking can do. Buy the lowest wine from something like Planeta because, you know, they're used to making $50 to $300 wines, but this is like their, their entry level. You're still getting that insane, like, 40 years experience winemaker. You're still getting the hand harvesting. You're still getting everything that they normally do. It's just their least expensive. It's their lost leader to get you into the Planeta family. And I can't imagine that Planeta is actually making money on the Plumbago. And if you go to an Italian restaurant in Calgary, and it's a good one, I would say there's a 100% chance you'll see this on the wine list just because it's so respected in restaurants. It's a little different with retail because, you know, Sicily's not a big category. But Planeta Plumbago, what a hell of a wine. Absolutely love this. What's the price point on it? 26 and that's as, that's as inexpensive as they make, Aaron. Like, it's just madness. Mm. 
So let's talk about Nero Davola. It is the brand name grape from Sicily. It is planted all over the island. Um, now, I did want to talk about IGT versus DOC versus DOCG. So I pointed out very early on with this that our Pinot Grigio here is an IGT. Um, in 2011, Sicily, everything on Sicily, pre-2011, everything on Sicily was IGT. And in 1980, you know, Sicilian table wine was this crazy new idea. What are these Italians doing? So from that point on, they actually went on to found another 20 different or 23 different DOCs on Sicily, each of which is its own unique thing. So Pericone, too new. This is still an IGT. Uh, DOC. So IGT, DOC, DOCG. Let's talk about this very briefly. IGT basically means the wine is of a quality standard. It's very much like VQA. You're not allowed to uh, capitalize by adding sugar. Uh, artificial acidification is limited to an extent. Um, you have to meet very, very basic good winemaking practices, but you can still make a $12 Pinot Grigio very comfortably at that price point. Basically, IGT means you're not doing something super insane. You're doing something that's typical for the region. Again, that's really loose in Sicily. IGT in Tuscany is actually much, much stricter. Once you get to DOC, or Denominazione d'Origine Controllata, um, now you're into, okay, not only are you doing it well, you're doing it what our region is known for. So you could never really have a DOC Pinot Grigio from Sicily because Pinot Grigio isn't you know, one of the native varieties. That's things like Grio and Inzolia and the two that start with C that I can't remember and I'm too lazy to look over and find out. Um, that's more what DOC is. DOC should be, okay, this is our heritage. This is what this island is made of. This is what we do. That's where you'll see DOCs. So this is DOC. I just don't know if Ariana bothers with uh, this. So this is actually IGT, um, probably because she's pulling from a couple of different regions and going different places with it. We'll talk about that in a minute. But DOC is basically, it's a higher quality standard chemically right across the board. They will probably ban you from artif artificially acidifying. And then it also has to be the local flavor. DOCG is um, Denominazione de Origen Controllata Garantizia, uh, and that Garantizia is even higher standards than DOC, and more than that, you know, all the old gray-haired winemakers and the new maverick geniuses of the region all sit around a big table together. There'll be the person from Planeta, there'll be Ariana Ochipinti, there will definitely not be anyone from this winery, uh, and they will all sit around together and they will hem and haw and blind taste every single one of those wines to say, yes, this deserves the DOCG. Yes, this is something that we as a collective wine region, the people of Sicily, the best winemakers from this part of the world, we want to put our stamp on or no, we don't. It's pass fail. There's no DOCG B plus. It's either pass fail. And it's brilliant. I love the DOCG system. There are parts of Italy where it doesn't mean as much because the boards are known to be really, really generous. Chianti comes to mind. Um, but no, for the most part, DOCG within Italy, it's about as much as you can legislate wine quality without going to the completely insane German system, which I love, but it's also complete insanity. And yes, the Planeta has an absolutely stunning nose. This is the first one I'll have a little bit more of, is the Planeta, because I really love this winery. And I love this wine. It's just, it's so friendly. It's like Merlot with more fireworks. I mean, I, I do love Merlot. I think if you've been watching this for any amount of time at all, you know I love Merlot. One of these days, also known as when I can actually find four wines that I like that will hit the price point we need to hit, um, I will do a Merlot night. I absolutely will. But this is Merlot plus a bit. It's Merlot with fireworks. It's Merlot with more florals. It's got more spice. It's got more just crunchy cherry fruit. Mm. That's just a wine that makes me smile like to the bottom of my heart. This just warms me up. I adore Nero Davola. I love this classic Sicilian style. So this is a wine that I genuinely love. Kevin, I'm glad you're uh, excited for Merlot night. That makes two of us, so that's good. 
Okay, so before we get into, you know, talking about next week's beer tasting and before we get on to the last wine, uh, I do want to talk about the bit of Sicily that's kind of hard to talk about, and that's Marsala. So of the fortified categories, we, of course, have port and sherry. We have Madeira, which is made off the coast of North Africa. And finally, from Sicily, we have Marsala, which most of you have probably bought the least expensive version you could find to put it in your chicken or veal Marsala. That's certainly what I buy 99% of my Marsala for. But Marsala has so much more going on than that. Of the three or of the four major varieties, Sherry is my favorite. Madeira probably comes in number two. But I would have a good Marsala before a port 99 times out of 100. I adore Marsala. This is something that someday, hopefully in my lifetime, is going to absolutely blow up because the level of complexity and interest and the layer of layers and layers and layers of flavors you get from good Marsala, it can be really, really special. Uh, the ones that we get over here, just like sherry, it can be bone dry. The ones we get over here tend to be semi-sweet to full sweet. They don't tend to be all that interesting, unfortunately. Uh, oddly enough, we get more high-end Madeiras than we do Marsalas. Um, they have a whole grading system. They have four different grades, which I didn't write down, so I'm not going to remember. Um, uh, all of which are based on time in barrel. Um, this is fine, which is actually the lowest grade. I think that means six months to a year in barrel. A year on, you would get, I think, superior, and then you get into the, the higher end versions above that. Um, Marcel is great. It, it really doesn't sell to anyone, but it's a huge part of the Sicilian wine industry. Um, in that paragraph, when I referenced very early on that this book had you know a paragraph about Sicily, um, they talked a little bit about Moscato production, which actually hilariously, since 1980, has more or less died out on Sicily. There's not that much Moscato made there anymore. But 90% of the uh, article was about Marsala. Table wine was j literally just this line that, yeah, they're making table wines there now. Isn't that cute? Hopefully they go somewhere with that. Marsala is the heritage of Sicily, and I hope someday it really does come back. But even the biggest optimist in me says, well, We've been saying that about sherry for the last 30 years, and it still hasn't gotten any traction, at least not with the general wine buying public. I think we're probably looking at a 60 year time frame for Marsala. So that puts me at 98, and I definitely will not live that long. So um, I'm never going to see the great Marsala explosion of 2080, um, which is a shame because it is coming. We'll be 30 years into net zero carbon output. That would be nice. Yeah, there we go. All right, so let's talk briefly about next week's beer tasting. Um, for those of you who didn't join us for the beer tasting, uh, there is no whiskey tasting uh, next week. I made that decision somewhat at the last minute, uh, basically because I could not find or did not like what I could get in terms of guest speakers for next week. Um, I'm very, very protective of the whiskey tasting series, especially since it's something that used to be completely free. I know I have to charge money for the whiskey series now. I don't like that. Um, and as a result, if I'm going to be doing one, it has to be absolutely top class. I will do a wine event without a guest. I think they're a lot of fun. I'll do a beer event absolutely without a guest. For the whiskey events, I want to have a guest. I want to make it can't miss, must see um, Facebook live video. Um, but I couldn't. I couldn't meet the quality standard that I demanded for the whiskey tasting, so I'm just scrubbing it. Um, beer tasting next week, though, that is absolutely going ahead, and I hope everybody has no plans Thursday morning. Book some time off work, take the day off, because we are doing high alcohol week. We are doing a double IPA. We are doing another double IPA. We are doing an 11.5 or probably 10.5% barley wine. We are doing a giant Belgian golden strong ale in the vein of a Duval. Uh, so one by Cabin, one by Blind Man, and two by 88. Um, we have got big boozy, powerful stuff on tap for you next week. Wednesday's going to be a mess. Uh, so if, whether you're joining us or not, you should at least watch me be an idiot for an hour as I drink incredibly high alcohol beer for an hour. That's going to end in tears, uh, and it's going to be great. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm very much looking forward to that. I know Aaron's looking forward to scraping me off the ground afterwards, so that's going to be good. So 
that gets us through our first three wines. I think we've talked about everything we have over in our things I would also need to talk about. Uh, we've covered the four major red varieties in Paracone, Nero de Vola. We will be covering Frappato in a moment. And of course, we talked about Norella Mascalese. Actually, just surprising length. I'm glad we actually got to spend some more time on that. Uh, white varieties we really don't see over here. Um, we did talk about the fact that there's Catarato, Grio, Inzolia, and uh, Caracante. I can't read my own writing. Um, I literally don't have a single one of those on my shelves right now. Not one. Um, Grio kind of tastes like Sauvignon Blanc, but slightly worse. Um, in Zolia, I've had one version. It was kind of like bright, fresh, lemony Trebbiano. But again, it wasn't desperately interesting. Uh, and I've never had the other two. So yeah, I, I don't have a ton of really kind of interesting Sicilian whites. But let's jump into the SP68 and the Ariona Ocipinti. Um, just like the Planeta, this is a very high-end winery. Uh, most of the other stuff we have from these folks is kind of $50 plus, or at least $40 plus. Um, we, if you remember, we had a big display of this up at the till uh, about Christmas last year. Uh, and uh, we got a really special buy on it at the time because they were they had brought in way too much. Um, and as we've discussed, Sicilian wines can be a bit of a tough sell. So with the agent, uh, in this case, sedimentary wines had brought in a little too much. They did a huge sale on it. We basically bought as much as we could get uh, to do like a big, big promo on it. So this is by far the best selling Sicilian wine in the history of the store because we got in on, on that big sale and it was a lot of fun. So let's get that in my glass. Okay, I haven't had a non right up Thursday since it started. Um, you know, I'm usually pretty okay after these, but yeah, I, I can feel that. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I, the reason that we have the $12 Pinot Grigio tonight is so that I could afford to put this in the lineup. This is a $30 wine. We don't do a lot of $30 wines in these because, you know, I have to get all these out the door for 80 bucks, all in, including tax. This is here so we could have this. And I thought we had a really interesting conversation about this. And I think for what it is, this is actually pretty damn good. But it's, it's there because I wanted to do this. 70% Frappato, 30% Nero de Vola. Um, this is what I find so fascinating about Sicily. The aroma is haunting. Like, I stick my nose in this and I'm going to be thinking about that bouquet for the next like three to five days. I love how this smells. It's light. It's floral. It has tons of dried fruit. It has rhubarb, like strawberry rhubarb pie. It has everything going on with it. And it's not a desperately expensive wine. This is literally their, their cheapest red wine. Mm. <laughs> and then you get it in the mouth. And it's so soft and it's so generous and it's, I don't know, it's the wine version of a hug. I really love how gentle this is. And yeah, the smell is unreal. Like, this is stupid for how good this, we actually had this for like twenty three ninety five dollars uh, because the agent had it on super sale last Christmas, I want to say. And yeah, we bought as much as we could at that price. But yeah, like, it's just a silly, silly wine. But this is what Sicily is capable of. So in 40 years, we've gone from, hey... They're trying to make table wine. Look at Sicily go, good for them, to this. And this is the least expensive thing this winemaker makes. This is why as much as Planeta has been the gold standard for so long, Ariana Ocipinti is just out here blowing people's minds. And she's doing it in Southern Italy, which is about, okay, there's a lot of super misogynist places in the world to make wine. Wine is very much an old boys club. I say standing here as an almost 40 white dude. Um, but yes, uh, really and truly, doing this in southern Italy, Ariana Ocipinti is doing staggering work, absolutely staggering work, making these incredible wines from grapes that, you know, Frappato right now is absolutely having a moment. But before Ariana Ocipinti, it just wasn't. It wasn't even a grape that people talked about. Two years ago, I didn't know what it was. I know what it was because of her. She's making the entire world sit up and take notice because of what she's doing. Can I talk about the winemaker a bit? I think I just did a little bit. Um, is it weird that SP68 reminds me of Jus? 
No, it's not. Um, it's not for a couple of reasons. It's not A, because it is a natural and biodynamic wine. So all the things you'd see with Jus, uh, it's, you know, natural ferment. It is no acidification or very limited. It's effectively no sulfur added. It's certainly not chaptalized. It's not processed in any meaningful way other than just wild yeast fermentation. It's a very natural product. But before that, uh, beyond that, it's it's a real sense of place. It's a sense of terroir. This is a wine that speaks of Sicily. It's a wine that uses the local varieties, uses them to their absolute maximum potential. Now, obviously, Canada in doesn't really have native varieties. We have the Vitis Labrusca family of vines, which honestly don't taste desperately great. Um, there are some hybrid grapes that we work with quite a bit that are crosses of Vitis Labrusca with Vitis vitifera, uh, like Marichal Foch and Bacon Noir. Um, those can actually be quite, quite good, um, but they take a very long time. Anytime you see Foch on the shelf, uh, it'll always tag itself as Old Vines Foch because that foxy character takes about 30 years to kind of stop showing up in the grapes uh, in terms of vine age. Oh God, I love this wine so much. So why this may have some similarities with Jus Red would be the fact that Jus is made with very, very complementary to the Canadian climate grape variety. So we don't really have our own, but you know, there are people who grow Cabernet Sauvignon in Canada. There's people who grow Shiraz in Canada. I've even seen a Canadian Petit Verdot, despite the fact our growing season's about a month too short. That's complete insanity. They will never ripen that. Maybe one year in 30, they will actually ripen that thing. Um, but what, Jou, what makes Jus interesting is the fact that he's choosing these medium to lighter weight grapes, which probably, to a certain point, have a lot in common in terms of how much body they contribute to uh, the SP68. It's just a really well-made wine using medium weight grapes that are just very complementary to where they're grown. That was a very long answer to a very simple question. Ooh, what would I pair the wines with? Um, Pinot Grigio is, I think, really ideal on its own um, because it is the ideal Karen wine. It really does go with just about anything. Um, I really like Pinot Grigio and Margarita Pizza. Uh, I really like Pinot Grigio and Fresh Tomatoes. I also really like Pinot Grigio with Basil. I think it really brings out some of the savory and herbal notes in Pinot Grigio that you can otherwise kind of miss. Pericone here, I would kind of drink it in the same sort of vein as like an Australian Shiraz or a Californian Cab. And you say I'm maybe doing a bit of a disservice, perhaps I am, um, but big, chunky, high fat, high protein dishes, steak, roast, lasagna, something where you just want something big and chunky and red to cut through that. The plumbaga is a bit the opposite. Um, this is the one I would be, this is my reaching for if I'm doing something really, really traditional with a lot of black olives or anchovies or a ton of fresh tomato. I'd be looking for this if I was making my own like all day uh, bolognese sauce that I was going to, you know, simmer for six hours. I'd be reaching for the plumbago because it'd just be the perfect thing. SP68, I think, is a little too light for that. Would this do just fine with your lasagna or your bolognese? Sure, this would do just great. I think this is more of a conversation wine. It's certainly one we've talked about quite a bit here. I kind of would like this as more a charcuterie plate or maybe pate. I think this there's, there's very few wines that actually can keep up with pate because pate is so complex and so fatty. Um, very often you've got the fat coating your tongue and then like the wine doesn't have enough acidity or enough power to actually cut that. I think this could actually do pate, which is very unusual. But yeah, this is this is very much just like a order an appetizer plate, you know, not hot wings, but anything else is kind of an appetizer plate and just have this with it. I think it would do absolutely beautiful with that. Otherwise, um, just kind of came to mind as I was talking, this in Christmas dinner, um, like a turkey dinner. There's a lot of cranberry to this that I wasn't expecting. Like, and, and it's a very specific, like, canned cranberry sauce or canned cranberry cock the, the jellied shit you put with turkey um this with like turkey dinner would have a real place and i think it would work very well with sage and all the things that go into like a traditional stuffing totally 
agree. I think this is like a Christmas dinner wine in the oddest way possible. Oh, also, you probably will be noticing I'm seeing your comments uh, sooner. We now have an eight-second delay rather than a thirty-second delay. Eight-second delay. Yep, because there was delay. there was a there was a setting buried deep, deep down in the software that was adding an additional needless twenty seconds. So it was twenty-eight seconds instead of eight. We just found that today. So yeah, where are we at for time? Oh, we made it to three quarters of the hour. Considering we're at 15 minutes at wine three, we managed to drag that out a bit. Good. <laughs> uh, will I be, ooh, that's a fun question, Di Deanne. Speaking of Christmas, will I be doing a Christmas case? Well, you remember when I showed you that, that wrapped box for uh, the beer tasting last week? Uh, and I said, oh, this box isn't for the, uh, it's not for the beer calendar, it's for something else. Uh, would you grab me one of those there, Aaron? They're just beside you there. You got your stuff on. You got your camera case on it, and they're all over my boxes. All right, here's a box. Thank you. You're so yes, we are going to be doing a Christmas case this year. Uh, Christmas case this year is going to be a bottle of sparkling, two bottles of rosé, two bottles of white, plus a really nice bottle of white to go with your Christmas dinner. We're going to do a big sh uh, French Chardonnay, uh, and then six bottles of red and. I think almost all of the bottles that are going into the case have featured in our wine tastings at one point or another. Um, they're all things like Gaudu Malbec and uh, the Venus Sophia, and I know most of them off the top of my head. Bro Brock Sellers Love Red is in there. Uh, the Man de Cara Beaujolais is in there. And we need the whole thing for 240 bucks. So you're going to get a bottle of bubbly for New Year's, a, couple, a bottle or two of rose, two bottles of white, really nice Christmas dinner, like turkey dinner white wine, and then just six bottles of red. They're not only our best sellers, but things that we all love and will speak to. We're doing it for, I think if you bought all the wines, you'd pay about 15% more if you bought them off the shelf. You save about 15 buying the Christmas case. But yes, um, we are in the process of wrapping them in wrapping paper. Um, the process was slowed down somewhat by the fact that we didn't expect our first 12 beer calendars to sell literally the day we made them. Uh, so for all of you who booked one, thank you. You are on the list. We do have you down for those. Uh, but yeah. The first 12 beer calendars, which we don't even release officially till tomorrow, because um, we were busy making them the last two days. Yeah, the, they're all gone. So we have to make another 12, uh, which we're going to do over the weekend. So thank you all so much. But yes, we do have a Christmas case this year. Thank you for reminding me. I was going to talk about this in, uh, two weeks from now, when I actually had them done. But yes, we are doing a Christmas case. And yeah, we can sign you up. Uh, rankings, everybody. The third for you, Mike. There you are. Now, let's start with you, Aaron. What are, where's your ranking on these four? You've had all four now. Yeah. I'm a stickler for an affordable thing, and I love my mother. One, four, th uh, two. One, two. Yeah. So three, four, one, two for Aaron. Yeah. Um, I really have a hard time arguing with that. It, I think we're charging 12 and a quarter. But I'm going to go one, two, three, four. The Paracone's neat, and I think there's a lot of potential to that grape variety. But I don't think that this wine, this wine's like $2 cheaper than this, and this isn't that. Um, I would rather have this and like an extra $12 rattling around in my pocket than this. Uh, value just for me on that. And double points for the fact it comes in a bag in a box. So. Oh, yeah. The box. Four, three, two, one. 4132. Oh, wow. Somebody actually put the Vina Grigio second. That's fun. Uh, 4321. 2431. Somebody had the Paracone first. I love that. Um, Sean, do you want to tell us why you had the Paracone second? I made my case for why I had it last, but tell us why you love the Paracone because that's fascinating. I love when somebody has my number four as their number one. I think that's great. 
Who said that? Sean Haney said that. Mike, you haven't had all four yet, so you don't get a vote. No, no. I've got my three ranking. Yeah, what's your three ranking then? Not including uh, the SB68. Not including that, it's uh, three, one, two. Three, one, two? Yeah. Okay. I'm kind of surprised that everything else is like in the 24 to 30 range. And this Pinot Grigio, yes, it's had some dead last votes, but it ran with 20 plus wines. I'm very impressed for a wine that I really only picked out A, to get the SP68 into the lineup price wise, and B, to talk about like, you know, Sicily's bad history of being this bulk wine region. And then the damn Pinot Grigio shows up and it's way better than I expected. So, yep. All right, Pinot Grigio, you win this round. Um, actually, Mike, I'm going to send you on a run here. Uh, Deanne asks, uh, how much is the box of this Pinot Grigio? And I actually don't know off the top of my head. Do you want to go check for us? I was going to try to guess, but... <laughs> I like how Mike tried to creep onto the camera despite the fact that the camera was on him the entire time. Uh, <laughs> 39.95. So 40 bucks gets you effectively the equivalent of four bottles of the Pinot Grigio. So, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, uh, if you buy it in box form, it's a $10 wine. So it's that, I think that's about what we charge for Jackson Triggs, and I would drink that 100 times in 100 over any Jackson Triggs. Is 1081? Yes, t yes it is. Okay, so yeah, I think we'll, uh, I think we'll call her there for a night. And yeah, campfire wine. Like, one of the things that one of these days i will actually do a tasting it will probably feature this um but a wines that i can get in bottles to actually do the tasting that also come in boxes because the quality of boxed wine um one of the things i'm always bemoaning to devon who tolerates me and puts up with my whining um is that we don't sell more boxed wine i'm not talking about you know schloss Lauterheim or peller or jackson triggs box wine i'm talking about things like sicilian pinot grigio and spanish tempranillo and south french uh, rhone blends by the chat petra folks there's some shockingly good wines being put in boxes um and it's staggering that they don't sell. Um, I actually, Devin was showing this this morning. Um, there's a product called Bagnum um, by one of our better French producers. I don't recall exactly which one, but literally they're, they're one and a half liter size. They're Magnum. It's just a, it's like a bag um, with, with a cap on it. That's kind of the, basically the same material as like a bag and box without the cardboard. And it's just called Bagnum, which is I think an amazing name for a wine. Uh, but yeah, fantastic stuff. Bagnum. Ladies here liked two best because it's so smooth and easy, very acceptable by a wide range of love wine lovers with proper red for many. Okay, I'll come back to two actually. I want to taste that. Uh, also, one of the fun things about tonight, so r obviously the Pinot Grigio was going to be first, but reading the tasting notes, like after doing all the research on Paraconi and hearing how it's like the tannic backbone, it's the big brother of Sicily, I kind of expected this was going to be last. But I tasted them one way, and I tasted them in the reverse. Uh, and I always do them generally in ascending price, just, you know, in theory, the last one should be the really impressive one, it should be the expensive one. Um, I was kind of surprised how much this wine was simple enough and approachable enough that it could actually be the first red. And it does have its own charm, doesn't it? I mean, I know I ranked it last, but it immediately brings a smile to my face. I love how rustic and earthy and kind of just honest it is. I really quite like this. I feel a little bad for ranking it last, but I still would not put it ahead of any of the others. All right, Aaron, I think we'll call her there. I think we're done. Yeah, ooh. But, okay, just before we call it good, wow, the chocolate has absolutely exploded on that from having been open for the last little while. Uh, yeah, once, we, uh, once we're done here, you got to get back in on this because the chocolate's just for days now. I do like a campfire. Awesome. Well, I've been Kyle with Andrew Hilton. Uh, Aaron is, as always, the man behind the camera. We do have a special guest cameraman. Thanks, Corey. Appreciate it. Uh, that's why we have a very different camera. We have a much nicer, well, don't know, nicer, larger camera for tonight. Uh, we are, as always, Aaron's test rig for everything definitely he does. Nicer. Um, <laughs> definitely nicer. Yeah. Apparently, it's a very expensive camera. Uh, but yeah, we're going to call her there. Thank you all so much, folks. We're going to take next Friday night off, uh, and then we will return. 
with a wine tasting TBD. We will figure out what we're going to do, and it'll be fun. Until then, I'm Kyle. That was Aaron. This was a lovely evening. Thank you all so much for joining us.